Does that mean I start? Yes, my apologies, everyone. <laughs> I just showed everyone what was behind the curtain. Okay. So welcome everyone um, to the first of, uh, of our fall PIA webinar series. Um, today, uh, I would like to welcome Mr. Brian Cameron. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, personal injury law and what is a personal injury lawyer and how they could help somebody with a brain injury. So Brian Cameron completed his LLB at Western University, and he was called to the bar in 2001. He joined Oatley Vickman in 1999 and began, became a partner in 2008. Brian represents people who have sustained serious injuries and the families of those who have died. His practice focuses on resolving claims arising from of motor vehicle collisions, boating injuries, occupiers liabilities claims, and product liability issues. Brian enjoys the complexities of personal injury lit litigation, but when it gets right down to it, he finds cases where the help he provides actually makes a difference in the quality of his client's life the most gratifying. When asked what he likes most about practicing personal injury law, Brian states that he enjoys sharing a person's life story from before they were injured with the jury so that they can see that the see the contrast as compelling evidence how the defendant drastically changed that individual's life. When Brian isn't practicing law, he enjoys traveling and playing poker. Welcome, Mr. Cameron. Thanks, Melissa. Um, welcome, everybody. It's nice to speak with you all. Uh, when I do these, I like to uh, ensure that everybody who has a question on any topic they wish uh, feels free to speak up or text or uh, whichever format we're doing in this, uh, because I really like to tailor these as much as I can, given what I know, to what you actually want to hear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go start going through a few of the uh, general issues that I've been asked to speak about. But again, I invite you, interrupt and try to stump me. Try to come up with a question that I can't answer, and then I'll get you the answer if I have to. So let's start with what a personal injury lawyer is. And, and the last part of my bio is really more important than anything else about being a partner or going to law school or doing all those things. I had to do that to do what I do. Um, what I spend most of my time doing, surprisingly, is not uh, arguing a case in court or going to the court of appeal, although that stuff is really fun. I spend most of my time trying to figure out what treatment providers are needed for clients, along with my team here, of course. Because my ultimate goal and the thing that I take the most satisfaction from is years later after I've represented a client, seeing them be as good as they can. Now, that does not mean they've healed, obviously, because sometimes you just can't do that. But the, my favorite memory of one particular client is doing a long trial, uh, getting a significant amount of money for this young fellow, and then going to his wedding and watching him do his first dance with his new bride. Now, he was in a wheelchair doing the dance, but um, his life was as on track as it could have been, and I was thrilled to play a part in that. And what personal injury lawyers do, the reputable ones anyway, are, are not put their face on buses um, or have the crazy commercials about Jim the Hammer or any of that nonsense. Um, they deal with real people who have real problems, and you try to fix the problem. And sometimes that's through the court. And sometimes it's making sure the right therapist is involved. And that's the most important part of the job I do is trying to get the people I deal with better. And uh, I really enjoy that part of it. Now, what I do encompasses uh, a host of injuries, a host of methods of being hurt. In my line of work, I, I've, I've got a daughter. Well, she's not so young anymore, but when she was young, I was the father with, you have to wear the helmet, you have to wear the knee pads, you have to wear the elbow pads, get off the trampoline and stay away from the pool. Uh, because I, I saw how people injured themselves in the most innocuous ways and ended up with life-changing injuries. And uh, that encompasses the range of what is an accident. Whenever you're injured, uh, you know, through the fault of someone else, you, you probably need someone like me because it's probably going to result in a big change in your life. But even if you're not, there's a lot of times I can, I can help, even with respect to making sure the right treatment team is involved. And I do deal with quite a bit of that. Now, as far as uh, 
specifics, uh, it could be almost anything. Uh, the, probably the bulk of my practice is auto injuries because you know, we have cars flying around at 120, 130 kilometers an hour. A good number of people get hurt, but there's uh, diving into pools. There's, uh, as I say, trampoline injuries, uh, bicycles, pedestrians, medical malpractice. I mean, there's a host of different ways that people are injured and suffer uh, life-changing injuries uh, as a result of the fault of another. And, uh, another question I get a lot, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, how much does it cost? How can I possibly afford to hire a lawyer? I'm, I'm 22 years old and I work a part-time job and I'm going to school and don't lawyers charge a whole bunch per hour and, and all that sort of thing. And, uh, and people in my business, the reputable ones anyway, don't. Um, I have never, since I left law school in 1999, and uh, the more I say that, the more I realize how old I'm getting. But uh, since I left law school, I've never billed a single hour to a single client for any reason, for any purpose. I, I get paid, there's no doubt about that, but I only get paid if I get results for a particular client. Uh, I get, you may have heard the term, I operate under a contingency fee agreement. That means I will pay for everything involved in litigating the case, which can be on a typical case, 40, 50, $60,000. And that's to hire doctors and get medical records and, and just move the claim through the system. And, and I will pay for all of that. Uh, at the end, if I recover money for the particular client, I get a percentage of the money that's preset, of course. Uh, it's 30% minus the cost. And um, none of my clients have ever paid out of pocket a penny. And none of the clients I'm aware of in this firm or any other reputable firm has ever actually paid money uh, to have a lawyer represent them unless they recovered something. It's very, uh, very easy to understand why. Because if you have somebody like the 22 year old or perhaps the 50 year old with two kids and um, can no longer work, well, they simply can't afford to go and retain a lawyer. Insurance companies pay their lawyer three, four, five hundred dollars an hour. I mean, who has the money money to pay that? So, um, so we represent these people, and uh, you know, we'll get paid at the end only if it's successful. Now, there's a another question I often get is. Uh, in addition to the, well, nobody else caused my, my injury, it, it sometimes is in a different way. What if I'm the one at fault? That comes up, I would say, 99% of the time in the context of uh, auto injuries. Everybody uh, on the call may have heard about uh, something called no-fault benefits. They, they started under the, the NDP government in 1990, so they've been around a long time. And uh, they are variably called accident benefits, statutory accident benefits, like I said, no fault benefits. And as the name would imply, uh, you get these benefits even if you are at fault. Uh, you know, if you make them, if you're driving and uh, you lose control on some dirt, although I suppose there could be a road authority case there, but uh, the typical sort of thing, and it's a single vehicle accident and, and you, you've suffered injuries and uh, they can obviously be quite significant. You don't need two cars involved uh, you know, to have a significant injury or be a passenger, for example. Um, but if you are at fault, in a, especially in an auto case, um, you're entitled to these benefits. And it depends, of course, on your level of impairment. When we talk about, about head injuries, and perhaps I'll stick to that um, uh, for, this, uh, for these purposes, but it could be anything, um, the amount you're entitled to could vary greatly. And it depends on the nature of the injury whether or not there's objective evidence of the head injury before that, and by that I mean uh, MRI, spec scan, that sort of thing, whether or not you're admitted to a hospital, and your level of impairment on something called a GOSI. Um, that's the Glasgow Outcome Scale, essentially extended. And at different periods of time, there's different levels of that. So understanding what level of benefits you have can be a very complex procedure. Uh, it, it needs uh, two things. It needs someone like me who understands what the law is. And then you need probably an occupational therapist and a neurologist to understand what the impairment is. Uh, the difference it makes can be dramatic because uh, this leads to something called a, a designation of catastrophic impairment. And again, we're still talking about no fault benefits. If you uh, get in an accident today and suffer some, any sort of injury, and it's not catastrophic, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute, but if it's not catastrophic, you only have access to 50,000 in med rehab benefits for five years. 
Now, if you are catastrophically impaired, which for head injuries generally means there was a bleed, if you're a child, you were admitted to a, a hospital, a rehab center as an inpatient, or you meet this uh, uh, GOSI scale I talked about, and there has to be a bleed for that, and, and that is a detectable brain bleed is what, what I mean. I'm sorry for speaking in short form. Uh, you may be catastrophically impaired. It, it depends on your functional status at the six month mark, the 12 month mark and the 18 month mark. And, and it varies. If you have more severe impairments at 18 months, you're more likely to be catastrophically impaired. What it means though is, is significant because your, your benefits go from 50,000 payable over five years to a million dollars payable over life for med rehab and for attendant care. So you can well see the difference. And again, it doesn't matter if you were at fault. Those benefits are available to you. Um, so it's, it can be a very complex procedure. And in any particular case, I can't tell anyone ahead of time, will you be catastrophically impaired? Need evidence for that. But it's something uh, definitely worth looking into if it's an auto case. Now, the at fault part for non-auto cases becomes more difficult. Our system, leaving aside no fault benefits, is generally premised on this idea. If somebody injures you, and uh, they did it uh, in a manner that we would call negligent. And negligence, fancy legal word, it just means that somebody did something stupid they ought not to have done. That's really all it means. Uh, then they may have to pay you. Now, there may be insurance issues, but you can sue them for doing something wrong that hurts you. Now, if you do something uh, to yourself, or there's nobody else involved, or it was your fault, and it's not an auto case, it's a much more difficult situation because you really don't have anybody to recover from. That is, nobody did anything to you that you could point to and say, well, that was their fault and I wouldn't have been like this had this not occurred. That doesn't mean there's no role for someone like me. Because you remember at the beginning, I said one of the most important things I do is make sure people have the right treatment. And that extends to these sorts of cases too. I have been involved, I, you don't see them as much as the other cases. I think it's because people don't think to call me, to be honest, but I haven't seen them as much. But we can at least, at the very least, make sure somebody has the right treatment team. Now, funding it may be a different story. There's government um, resources that are available through various agencies that will help people, as you well know, I'm sure. Um, and, and we're familiar with those and can help people get set up with those. There are a lot of times I have to resort to those in auto cases because we run out of funding. So we have to look at... Uh, assistive devices programs and uh, the Ontario drug benefit and uh, various um, ODSP, Ontario Disability Support Plan, uh, to find people to help. And uh, I've done a few of those, but admittedly fewer. And like I said, I think it's really because people don't think there's anything I can do to help them. And really what I can do to help, help them is maybe one of the most important roles I play in that helping them does not mean solely issuing a claim and being a lawyer and fighting with an insurance company and, and getting money. That's part of my job. But part of my job is making sure that people can get as good as they possibly can. And the only way to do that that I'm aware of is making sure they have the right treatment people, the right uh, psychotherapists and the right psychologists and the, the right RSWs and PSWs and things like that. And it's a, it's a very important element. Now, another common question I get, is how long does it take a case to settle? Um, I, in fact, I, minutes before this, I, I finished a pretrial and uh, my client it, you know, it was complaining to say the least about how long this seems to take. Why is everything so long? Now, admittedly, COVID has really thrown a wrench into what we do. Uh, much like everything else, the courts have been open but operating in a far different manner kind of like what we're doing here today. Uh, we're conducting hearings through this format and it's taking longer to get them done. But before this, a lawsuit does take quite a long time. It takes, you, you measure the time in years generally, um, perhaps 18 months to two and a half years, perhaps longer depending on the case. And part of that is the system. And part of that is, and this is the more important part, that before you can resolve a case, a person has to heal as much as they can. That is, right after a typical accident, somebody is in worse condition than they are a year later. That's not always true, but typically that's true. And then perhaps a year later after that, they may or may not be better. 
what you have to wait for is a, the, the time, and the doctors refer to it as plateauing. You have to wait until a doctor concludes whatever the impairment is, this is about as good as it's going to get. And now we can predict the future with a little bit of certainty. What services the person's going to need, how impaired they're going to be, if they're going to be able to work. Because it's only then that someone like me can start to put a value on these claims. Because the value is, is quite different. And, and that's what I need to do. I need to determine if the 45-year-old uh, breadwinner for a particular house is able to work again. Because if they're not, it's important that I recover what they lost uh, or they're not gonna be able to feed their family. And that's a very important consideration. Or they may need ongoing physiotherapy or psychological services for the rest of their life. Well, that's gonna cost money. I need to know with some degree of medical certainty what they're going to need, not only now, uh, because that's easy to know. I, when I figure out what they need now, is just ask a, a doctor, what do they need now? I need to know what do they need in 10 years? And then I need to talk to somebody about what will I cost in 10 years? And fortunately, uh, people who do accounting and definitely not me will figure that out for me, but I, I understand what to ask them and what to get. So that's part of the reason it takes so long to settle. You gotta wait till your condition plateaus. And then you add into that the court issues and getting to trial and scheduling dates. I mean, it takes a while, but the most important thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about time is this. And I, I, I probably have to explain this to the younger clients more than the ones that are older, because the younger ones still don't understand the passage of time, quite like uh, uh, us older folks. When you do a case like this, uh, a lawsuit, you only get to do it one time. You have to do it right the first time, because it's the only time. To settle a case uh, a couple of years early, earlier, simply because you've decided, I can't do this anymore. I don't like the, lo the defense lawyer. I'm aggravated. I think it will give me closure. I, I hear all of these things. And they're all legitimate worries. And they cause problems for clients. But to settle it earlier, uh, at least before a time where, where I think it's ready to be settled, you risk this. Um, you are definitely going to be undercompensated. Now, if it turns out that you're maybe not as bad as some of the doctors thought 10 years down the road, well, you made a good deal. The more likely scenario is, however, this. You settle early because you're desperate, or, or, or one I, I didn't even think of, but it's equally as important. I'm desperate for the money. I have to have the money now. I, I can't work. I can't get the things I need. I'm, I'm going to lose my house. Again, all legitimate concerns. But if you settle it now, and you're worse off in 10 years than you thought you would be when you settled the case, there's nothing I can do for you at that point. Um, this is one of those instances in life where you get one shot, that's it. Um, if you don't do it right, and that's a, another reason why it's so important to have a, a good personal injury lawyer that is willing to wait the years to get it done and put in the time and effort and the money uh, to get it done correctly. It's sad to say there's a lot of people in my business who run like Walmart. And what I mean is this, they run out of volume. They have a lot of clients, a lot more than I do. And they settle cases quickly and cheaply. And they earn money because they settle a lot of volume. That's all fine and good in the present. And I'm sure maybe the client is happy, mostly because they don't have a clue what they've given up and maybe never will. But I'd like to look up some of these people in five or 10 years and see how they're doing. And maybe some are fine, but I'm, I'd be willing to bet that most of them, uh, most of them are not. And it's a tragedy because this is a, the kind of business where very few people really understand what's going on. You see the billboards, you see the ads. That's not what this business is. This business is about helping people more than anything else. Now, I <clears throat> get asked this a lot as well. Do all cases go to trial? No. In fact, almost none do. I would guesstimate 99% of civil cases in the province of Ontario, perhaps in Canada, settle prior to trial. Now, there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one of the most significant ones is cost. It costs a significant amount of money to go to trial, hundreds of thousands of dollars in a typical case with even relatively serious injuries. Uh, and that's only what the plaintiff will spend. The insurers will spend several hundred thousand dollars. And insurance companies 
say what you will about them. They're, they don't want to be in the business of losing money. If they can settle a case for a reasonable amount, they will. And most plaintiffs are like that as well. If you can settle a case for a reasonable amount, you will. Because what you buy for yourself, partly, if it's a reasonable number, is certainty. Because every trial has this going on with it. Uh, risk. Um, my clients, for example, know what happened and know how they feel because they live it. There's no doubt about that. How a jury will perceive that could be different, or even a judge, for example. How bad the headaches are, especially with non-objective injuries. And head injuries tend to fall into that, uh, being non-objective in the sense that there's no test that you can run, a physical test, similar to, for example, an x-ray, that will tell us what the impairment is. And sometimes juries perceive things differently. So there's always risk in a trial. Anybody who tries to tell you, I know what will happen at a trial, is delusional. They're either, either delusional or stupid. I don't know which it is really. It's maybe a mixture of both, but they have no connection with what a jury system is. And I don't know who I'm, I can't see the faces, but usually when I can, I can say, well, we're either old enough or not old enough. I don't know what it is uh, to remember the OJ Simpson trial about, it's almost 30 years ago. Um, and we all remember thinking, well, of course he killed those, uh, those two people. Uh, the jury said, uh, no. The jury said not guilty. Now, the important thing to understand about that verdict was it doesn't matter if it was right or wrong in the, in the sense of did he kill the people or not. The legal outcome was exactly the same as uh, if he really didn't do it, which is obviously ludicrous, but the legal outcome's the same. So sometime you go before a jury and they don't agree with you uh, for whatever reason. They don't have the evidence or um, they just don't like you or uh, anything. There's a host of different reasons. I could spend all day talking about what problems are heading to a trial. And that's another reason that not a lot of cases go to trial because very few people who suffered an injury and, uh, you know, just a typical uh, middle-class hardworking person can contemplate the scope of the loss if they lose. I mean, think of the situation you're in and I use this example with clients many times, if, if an insurance company offers you hundreds of thousands of dollars to settle your case, and you may think it's worth more, and the lawyer, I may be telling you it's worth more, but how many people would be willing to put that amount of money on a roulette table? Because that's a lot of the times what a trial is like. You don't know the outcome at a time, and you can predict with some level of certainty some issues. You can predict a range of outcomes in terms of how much you're going to get, but no lawyer, if any lawyer ever tells you, I guarantee your recovery, this is the, your, your immediate response should be, well, that's fantastic. Can you put it in writing? And they won't. Uh, and if they do, hire them. I mean, if anybody is dumb enough to put it in writing, well, I suppose you got a contract with them, but they're also dumb enough to put it in writing. So maybe you don't hire them. But uh, it doesn't quite work like that. And, and the reason why that's so important in cases of going to trial is very few people can afford to take that risk. Um, even though they know they might get more, even though they know how they feel means I live this every day. It's terrible. But if a jury doesn't agree with me, I'm going to be in worse condition because not only am I going to have whatever the impairment is, whatever the injury is, I'm going to have to live with that forever. I'm also going to have to live with next to no money. Well, how am I going to do that? So they make that decision to uh, protect their family and protect themselves. And it, it's on a personal level, the correct decision. The biggest reason I don't do more trials is at the last minute, the client gets nervous and says, what's going to happen at trial? And I have to be honest with them. And I have to tell them, I like our case. We should go ahead. You have strong evidence. You're likable. But I can't guarantee an outcome. And they decide that they have to do what they have to do. And they decide to settle. Now, the reason this happens, of course, is insurance companies have all the money. Um, I'm not one of those that think they're evil. I think they're just businesses that do things and they try to make money. Sometimes some particular people tend to be evil, but generally speaking, that's not been my experience. But they also can afford to lose. If an insurance company makes a wrong decision, the last trial I took the verdict, the insurance company offered $300,000 and we got 3.3 million. Now, that was a great outcome for my client, obviously. Uh, but nobody at the insurance company got fired. Nobody lost their job. I think it was State Farm. I can't remember. It might have been State Farm. Wrote a check. And uh, that was the end of it. They just made a bad call, a bad decision. They shouldn't have taken us to trial on this case. 
I think their lawyer probably told them not to, but somebody there decided, well, we're going to go ahead. Okay. Didn't put them out, out of business. They can take that risk because they, they view things not on each individual case, but they view it. We're managing 10,000 cases. We're going to make money overall. So this is how we're going to deal with this. They have that luxury because they can afford to lose. Uh, none of my, well, I shouldn't say none, very few of my, my clients uh, can afford to lose. And so they make the reasonable decision, even though it may pain them, and even though they know they're worse off than the defense accepts or the defense doctor accepts, they know they have to do that to protect themselves or protect their family. It's usually their, for their family. Don't see as many single people doing this. They might be a little more willing to roll the dice. But once you have other people that you're responsible for, I tend to see them being a little less or a little more risk adverse. All right. About 10% of my practice is uh, fixing mistakes other lawyers make. And it's not because they're not good lawyers, it's because they're not involved in personal injury law. And hiring someone who specializes in this, it's all I've ever done is important because we have the most, the strangest set of personal injury rules, uh, perhaps in Canada, although there's some close runner ups, I, I have to say. And it's a very specialized area of law. For example, when I get a question, because as soon as you become a lawyer, your friends immediately call you with every legal question that they may have. And it's rarely personal injury in my case. Um, and I have to tell them, I don't have a clue. I don't know anything about criminal law. I don't know anything about family law, tax law, corporate law, nothing. I know absolutely nothing about it. I have to call an expert. And the same thing happens in personal injury law, except for a lot of people will call their uncle who knows his real estate lawyer and, and they make the mistake of taking on the case thinking, oh, it can't be that hard. Uh, some drunk ran a stop sign and hit my you know, this young lady, and now she's severely injured. Um, if it were that simple, then uh, anybody could do it, and not anybody can do it. Uh, it's not that it, a particular real estate lawyer isn't smart enough to do it. They just don't know the rules. It's like trying to play a game. It's like trying to play chess, and nobody tells you what the knight does. Well, you know what? You're going to lose. You're going to lose every game. But um, I see that happen quite a bit. So it's very important that you, if you're hurt, and if you need help, you at least ask some simple questions, and this gets to qualifications. I alluded to this earlier, and I talked about I'm not on a bus, and you know I don't have those crazy commercials on TV and uh, and that sort of thing. And I do that for a reason. One, I don't want to do it; I would be embarrassed. But you need to know if the lawyer is actually qualified, and you certainly can't tell it from those particular things. Some lawyers are advertised are qualified. Most aren't. I've noticed an inverse relationship. The more advertisements, the less the actual trials they do. What you want to know from your personal injury lawyer, primarily, a lot of details, but how well they know the law. But to be fair, you won't know what questions to ask. That is, you can't quiz somebody on the definition of catastrophically impaired, for example, if you don't know what that means. Um, but you can ask them questions like, when's the last time you did a trial? How often do you go to trial? When's the last time you argued an appeal? When's the last time you argued an emotion? Start to get some of those answers. You at least start to get a feel of how experienced they are in the actual litigation process inside the courtroom. And here's why that's so important. Because remember, I told you 99% of cases settle. So that applies to me as well. I don't try 99% of my cases. But if the insurance companies don't believe that you will go to trial, it's, it's much like uh, when you're trying to buy a house, for example, and, somebody, and you know somebody has to sell and they have to sell by next week, of course, your offer is going to be lower. How that applies to what I do is if the insurance companies know a particular lawyer will never go to trial, they never offer a good number because they know they're never going to have to incur the expense for going to trial. They're not going to have to prepare for trial. They're not going to have to pay their lawyers $300, $300 an hour. They know that at the last minute, this lawyer is going to fold, going to take whatever they're offered. Now, I'm not talking about anybody in specific, but just lawyers that are known for that. And believe me, there are many that have not been in a courtroom in years, um, perhaps never. And you want to at least know that, because if you start to know that, because if insurers know, look, if we can't agree on a reasonable number, which I'm able to do most of the time, but if we can't do that, then we're going to go to trial. 
and this is going to cost you money. Am I willing to take the risk? I am, as long as the client is. Because at the end of the day, it's your case, it's your life. Uh, someone like me gives you advice. I hope you take it because I've done this for a while. But it, you're going to make the decisions you make for, for your own purposes and, and what suits your own life. But start to ask those sorts of questions. And if you get a lot of either vague answers, oh, it's been a couple of years, um, go to Google. Google somebody's name because there's a whole bunch. If you go to a website called Canly, C-A-N-L-I, uh, you'll find cases, uh, reported decisions of judges. Google the lawyer's name. See how many cases they pop up on. If you don't get many hits, you might want to move on to another lawyer. That's probably one of the best ways to know if your personal injury lawyer is qualified. You know, ask those sort of questions. Remember, you're in essence, buying a service. It's, uh, you know, if you were going to get your roof repaired, you would do the same sort of process. You would go on Yelp. You would, you would Google them. You would get a couple of quotes to see who's going to give you the best deal. You ask a few questions and find out where you're at. There's no reason it should be any different. Uh, there's a personal element that doesn't exist, for example, in, you know, repairing your roof or any other service. You got to make sure you're comfortable with your lawyer and his staff and make sure they get back to you in a timely fashion. It's all very important. Now I see, I've talked for about 30 minutes. Um, I don't see any questions. I'd love to have questions, but that's okay. So it either means you weren't listening or um, you've tuned out completely and I'm okay with that too. Um, or I covered what you want. I'm hoping it's the last part. Um, I've tried to give you information you can use, but I really appreciate uh, everybody uh, being here and, uh, and being so attentive and um, subject to any questions. I don't think I have, uh, have anything else to add and I'll, I'll throw it back to Melissa. Thank you so much, Mr. Cameron. It was actually incredibly informative. Um, I'm not certain if there are any questions. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm just going to ask, um, again, if you kind of hover your mouse a little bit over your screen, um, <laughs> menu will pop up and you can either raise your hand, you can write in the Q&A box or in the chat box, or you can even, like we said earlier, request to speak. Uh, I'm gonna go around one more time and I'm gonna, send you a pop-up that will ask you to unmute if you would like to um, and you can speak directly to Mr. Cameron and if there are no other um, questions so I will give you a couple more minutes but if there are no other questions um, then that's okay too um, this is going to be recorded and put on our um, website um, with links to our YouTube channel um, I see one question that just popped up um, so, Mr. Cameron, um, one of our members has asked, is it true that if you are part of a union and injured at work, that you have to use their lawyers and you can't hire a personal injury lawyer? Yeah, that, that is generally true for a couple of different reasons. One, your particular union agreement may require that any grievance through WSIB is done through the union. I mean, I've seen that. I'm not a labor lawyer, but I have run into that a few times. The second important thing to note about that is if you are injured at work while you are working in the course of your employment is the legal term, you can't sue your employer. Um, it's, uh, it's barred by section 28 and 29 of the uh, work, Workplace Compensation Act, uh, work, or worker safety. I'm sorry, I drew a blank on the, the title, but the workers' compensation regime takes away the right to sue when you're in the course of your employment, you can't sue somebody else who's also in the course of their employment. But if you're a delivery driver, for example, you could sue just a random driver who's not working. Then you make something called an election. But generally speaking, that's true for those two reasons. Does that, does that answer your question? I see it was Denise who asked. I think so. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Yeah, that was a great question. I had, yeah. So yeah, she says, yes, I think so. It's more for fighting WSIB. Okay, well then I can, uh, there are lawyers who do just WSIB work. I'm not one of them. Um, the name that pops to mind is a fellow named Richard Fink. I believe he's out of London. And my understanding of Mr. Fink is that he does basically nothing but WSIB 
And I know I've referred many people to him when I learned that there's nothing I could do to help him because I'm not as familiar with the WSIB system. You'll remember I said that this becomes very specialized what I do. And I want to stick to the my issue because the law can be complicated. I'm not a generalist. I'm not going to go then into the WSIB system because I think there's people better suited to do that that are more likely to be able to help the, you know, the particular, at least potential client I talk to. So I will send them generally to him. Um, uh, he's the, the one that comes to mind. There aren't a lot of people that do it, but there are a few. And I'm sure you could find a few more just on Google. Google is a fabulous tool for checking people out. I'll tell you that. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can't hide anything anymore. All right, so she responded with, thank you so much. So yes, that absolutely answered her question. It's a very complicated um, section of law. And so oh. it's- Well, I, I teach this at Queens and um, I will get people who wanna be lawyers who are second, third year lawyers who after a three hour lecture on one point of law, don't have a clue what's going on. Um, so um, it takes a while to get it through to them. It's a uh, it took me 20 years and I only know about 5% of it. So, you know, you, you keep, if you're not learning every day, you're, you're falling, you're falling behind. Yes. Very true. Yeah. Very true. And I'm assuming a lot of, um, a lot of little pieces, uh, you know, change with some regularity. Well, but every three or four years, they have a wholesale change in the law. Oh, wow. Where, where they'll change the statutory accident benefits. They'll change the rules with respect to suing somebody. They'll change some of the procedures. So it's, it's constantly, I got to check the date and figure out what the limits are for various types of injuries. And uh, it changes a lot over the course of time. So again, you have to keep up, but I guess part of it is that keeps it interesting. It'd be awfully boring if it never changed. So I would have learned it 18 years ago and not learned anything since I, you know, I think my brain would have atro atrophied at that point. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the challenge is good. So it's, I like keeping on top of these things. And that's part of the reason I teach because I got to debate these law students every day for three, well, not every day, but once a week for three hours and I got to stay on my toes or I'm going to look like an idiot. And I, I don't want that. Yes. Um, I'm just typing in the chat box. Um, and I think law too is probably one of those areas where, you know, um, if you're if you're drawn to that type of career, that it is a place where you um, enjoy that uh, continuing education or that continual learning um, and just that uh, like feisty brain work uh, with other people as well. well. It's fantastic. I, I'm at work now. How good is that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I get to do this for a living, and I get to yeah. help people at the same time. I mean, it's uh, it's a unique job from that point of view. Uh, I get to help people. Um, I, and I get to make a decent living doing it and I get to accomplish things that, uh, help society in general. I mean, the reason we don't have asbestos anymore is because of personal injury lawyers, because we made it so expensive for there to be asbestos. And the reason that, um, the, uh, pajamas your children wear are flame retardant is because of personal injury lawyers or the Ford Pinto The reason why there's airbags is because of personal injury lawyers. So uh, over the last 80 years, I know we get kicked in the teeth a lot by the insurance company calling us ambulance chasers, but we've made the world a safer place over the last 80 years. And I go back about 80 years, that's really when it started to happen in the history of tort law. But all these things, uh, uh, lead in the water, uh, fluoride, uh, uh, like I said, asbestos, uh, cars with gas tanks that explode, like the, the famous Ford Pinto, um, carcinogens, uh, overdosing on, um, uh, what's that drug there, uh, Percocets, and fentanyl. The reason fentanyl doesn't exist anymore is because of people like me and because people are dying. And uh, the only way to make a company stop when you're making a lot of money selling fentanyl is to make it more expensive to sell fentanyl. And that's exactly what happened. The reason the air is cleaner is because of lawyers like me and water. Um, so it's a, a good group to be in. There's just a few bad apples like everything else. So can't That's make it go away. You just got to do your job the best you can. Mm -hmm. It sounds a little bit like a, like a dream job for, for some, you know, yeah. and quite rewarding. 
Yeah. yeah. In a lot of ways, in every way possible, really. Let's see. I think we've exhausted think, the question. I think so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of, uh, you know, I'm going to, um, I thought I was going to see another question there. Um, so I'm going to say goodbye uh, officially, and then I will be um, stopping recording. If you want to stay behind for a few minutes, um, I welcome you. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Cameron, for your time today. And thank you to Oatley Vigmund um, for bringing such an incredibly informative webinar to, to BIST and, and our members. Um, thank you. And it was a pleasure. Thank Thanks you. for having me. There we go. And oh, my screen share is not on. Let me just share my screen. My apologies. Sometimes we're a little bumpier. <laughs> so just for everybody um, to just kind of uh, see here, this is, um, so this is Mr. Cameron um, and this is his email address. Um, his email is B Cameron, B C A M E. R O N at oatleyvigman.com. If you'd like any support to connect with them, um, please feel free to email me at connections at bist.ca and I can absolutely um, help with that. Um, our next PIA webinar will be next Wednesday, September 22nd at one o'clock, followed by our final PIA webinar. September 29th at one o'clock. And so I hope to see you all there. Um, and again, if you would like any help to get in touch with Mr. Cameron, please connect with me at connections at bist.ca or feel free to email Mr. Cameron directly at bcameron at oatleyvigmund.com.